Hi everyone, welcome back to the Stay Hungry podcast. It's Joel and Andy, and today we're talking about unstoppable entrepreneurial mindset. Bloody hell, Andy. Two in the bag today. I know, done well, haven't we? Stephen couldn't believe that uh, we sort of uh, haven't got loads and loads of episodes in the bag. Oh, really? Just so, yeah, just been so busy, haven't we? But yeah, I think we just need to block off like an afternoon every week or it's something. pretty good for us as well, I think, this. Like, sounds a bit self-indulgent, but sometimes you forget what you know. Yeah, we just want, want to share it with some people. Yeah, podcasts, I think. Um, oh, because we've had some great guests on. But funnily enough, the, big the episodes that are yeah. most popular seem to be the ones of you and Marth or me and you, or, you know, just chewing the fat and sharing some of the stuff we know and picked up over the decades, centuries. Yeah. And apparently this one's about an unstoppable entrepreneurial mindset, which might be the longest podcast title ever. Cultivating. Fucking yeah, hell. Yeah, well, I didn't say that bit. Okay. So we're all good. Um, yeah, and basically, I guess the, the, the point that we talk about mindset a lot on this podcast, and for want of a better phrase, an unstoppable entrepreneurial mindset, is that building a business is tough. Hate for everyone, that's for sure. Yeah. And building a, I, w- I want to say proper business, <laughs> is even tougher. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I think plenty of people can make a living. That's not the same as having a business. And when you get into the place where you need systems, processes, scalability, saleability, um, yeah, all the stuff that you love. Yeah, I've just been talking to, well, that guy who's coming in for an MTS strategy session. Um, uh I got Evie to run him through Waybook, just a freebie over Zoom. And yeah, he's fully embraced it now, putting all his processes in there, and he feels so much clearer on mm. and on his business. And, and when he recruits now that, here we go, here's a manual of how I do things. And he loves all that. And I was like, I understand it. I, I totally appreciate it's important, but fucking I don't want to do it. It's not your bag at all, is it? No. But you know, my, my brother's a teacher. He loves organisation. He loves processes. He loves helping children, so literally, I can't think of anything worse. But he can't think of anything worse than running your own business as well. Yeah, he likes picking up your own uh, steady paycheck every month. He loves working nine till three half the year. You know, it's uh, <laughs> just a shout out to one of your teacher friends, there, Joel. Yeah, it's bloody horrible, that is. <laughs> yeah, God, I mean, I couldn't, about I teachers, couldn't like, do what they. Do. Oh, can you imagine it's some of the little shits? Oh, well, now. yeah. I mean, I was having Not a com- just my kids. I was having a conversation this morning about how tough society is at the minute for many people and some of the kids that must come into these schools at the minute teachers are heroes yeah absolutely I, I, I wouldn't do it um, but then because you're a social worker as well right it's like for certain parents I think well mm-hmm. guardians that they just, just some, some of the stuff these kids go through teachers aren't there to raise your children they're to educate them yeah but I mean we're so fortunate to be sheltered through from some of the shit that these kids, you know, fostering an entrepreneurial mindset is a piece of piss compared to what some of these kids are going through. So, aye, aye. Um, yeah, so I guess, like, the thing to think about in business, the, thing, the, the hurdles you're going to encounter are, like, um, I mean, the big one that often derails people is slow sales, periods of slow sales, um, things not working. Getting the twats. Dealing with dickheads. Like, yeah. so, so we're lucky because we deal with other business owners, but obviously a lot of our clients deal with the public. Yeah, you nearly said the great unwashed. The great unwashed. I mean the great British public, and you know if we're talking to say a gym owner who's got like three thousand members, he or she is going to be dealing with f- quite a few fair dickheads. You know, like so like we, we, we know the entitlement we see is 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 rife. Could you imagine? If you have to deal with the public, what we we work with an awesome gym owner at the moment, um, but they they were having a lot of trouble in their gyms of under sixteens, so they had to ban under sixteens. The shit that caused, really, from people related to them and other members, Uh. just like the the sort of compartmentalisation you'd have to do to just be able to sleep at night, having made that decision would be significant you're talking serious sums of money 
that people, you know, just just because it's, it's you're trying to protect like your other members. Being a member of a gym or being a being a a, a customer somewhere, it's not compulsory. Mm. So if you're really not happy with your gym, guess what? Fucking leave. Go to another gym. Well, I, I and I think this is something that business owners have to work on is all problems are a leadership problem so mm-hmm. it ultimately is your problem but people don't have a right to work with you so just because you offer something doesn't mean everyone can have it and that's really tough because you can't discriminate that's that's illegal mm-hmm. but you can be selective in your tonality and the way that you do business and the way that you decide to operate so that you're not for everyone. And sometimes it's really hard because I think generally the level of entitlement entitlement in society, everyone thinks that they're entitled to everything. And so it's like, well, you're too expensive for me. How am I ever going to be able to grow my business? For example, that's something we've heard. You're, you're, you know, ha- surely don't you, don't you want to help the little guy kind of thing? It's like, well, yeah, I'd love to. And I'd, put out a lot of free resources and you can buy my book and watch my webinars or come to an event and see me speak but what I can't do is run your advertising campaign for you for that price when I'm running an advertising campaign for Bob down the road at an entirely different price that's not ethical either you're too expensive is another way of saying I can't afford you yes yeah. yeah but like the days of the customer's always right are just long gone it's like you and I and, and other business owners go through too much shit to, to, to put up with dickheads. Yeah. And it's like, I, I, if, if, if the way that we price things doesn't fit with your budgets, that's fine. But you don't have to kick off and expect me to reduce my prices. Yeah. And, and I totally appreciate, and this is a mindset Martin thing. Martin fucking Lewis says. <laughs> to- but, again... Martin Lewis does a great job of sticking up for the little guy in, in various in various things where people have been wronged. Go shopping with my mum and, and you, you'll but, change your mind about Well, Martin yeah, because you can't negotiate on the price of a light bulb. Yeah, I get it. She literally has haggled over one light bulb. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> God, it was embarrassing. I'm, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not sure that's Martin's fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, Martin Lewis said you should always... Oh, mum, if you're buying 100 light bulbs, not one. <laughs> but that whole, like... You ha- like... Us pricing ourselves out of a certain marketplace or us tonally speaking in a way that means certain people don't want to work with us or us having a certain set of values means that people out there will think we're dickheads and that's okay. I'm upset now. But yeah, <laughs> but it's that whole like having the mindset to be to have the clarity to be like, it's all right for people not to like me. It's all right for people mm-hmm. to say bad things about me. Because that means, for every person that's saying, like, this is kind of how I I look at it. For every person that's saying something bad about me, someone else will be thinking that's a good thing. And that's not strictly true, but it's it's a healthy way to think about it. If one person says you're too expensive, someone else says, well, they're just not for you. Oh, God. I read a quote the other day. It was attributed to Mike Tyson, whether it was him or not. But I don't know. But someone like, oh, fucking I was. Like, if if everyone likes you, you're doing something wrong. I'm going to have to fucking look it up now. Because, yeah, if you're, if you, I mean, we say this in, in your marketing message, if you're trying to appeal to everyone, you, you will appeal to no one because you don't want anyone to not like you. But the flip is, you won't get anyone to love yeah. you. They'll, they'll be a bit, a bit yeah, ambivalent. The best, way, best way to remember that is the kids at school that kind of floated. Who you can't even remember their surname. Now. Yeah. And it's brutal. But I don't mean it in like a bullying sense. And I, th- I think I was a bit of an in-betweener. I, I, I think sometimes I tried to people please too much. You don't find your tribe. You don't find... Surely who... you were the only six foot two, 12-year-old at school. Well, there, there was an element of that. <laughs> With a beard. I, th- I, th- I, th- I, th- I think when people were like, fucking hell, he's had a growth spurt. Things changed a bit. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was that whole like... If you sort of tried to be everybody's friend... Just because you're a nice person, it doesn't actually work. You just end up with no friends. Yeah. And I th- and also when it comes to things like pricing, businesses have different overheads. So so we are an agency with the team. We have premises that we pay for. 
So guess what? Our overheads are going to be much greater than, than a marketing freelance, freelance. Working from home. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes a business owner will still say, well, well, Bob is like a third of the price. But Bob fucking works from his mum's bedroom. Yeah. And he's uh, got no, no and when, staff and he's when, responsible for. Yeah, when Bob's like having to bounce ideas on what's really important for your next lead magnet, he's only got himself in the cap to ask. Where our team can all get together in a huddle, as we do every week, bounce ideas, come up with ways to improve things, come up with the bits that we need to get rid of, and then go back and provide that value to the client. Neither is wrong, but that's the difference in the price point. That's the difference in, difference in the value. Yeah, yeah, a- absolutely. And and we've realised now that, well, not now, but certainly um, it wasn't the case at the beginning. That we just it's not good to have to convince people if someone comes to you and says yeah come on then like show me convince me why why i should use you as my marketing company or whatever it is you do and it's like, so if i need to convince you no. you're not the right person yeah, yeah 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 so so you know that guy um uh, had in for a strategy session ye- yesterday um for one of his businesses but he's in another business and he's got two or three partners in that and they're like, oh yeah they're not interested in marketing it's all about word of mouth um, and he said, because I was trying to convince them to, to, to come in for this. I said, no, no, you've done the right thing coming on your own. Because if you need to convince someone again, they're not right. Their mind's made. I think people either appreciate marketing, they'll see it as investment, or they'll see it as a cost. I, I think most people have to find marketing for themselves. They, they get to a point where they realise they need it. And until they're at that point, trying to convince them otherwise, is just mm. a, a, apart from people that see it as the shortcut, but the reality is it's o- marketing is only a shortcut when you've got all your other ducks in a row. And I had this exact conversation today. If you're shit hot on your organic social, your offer's really good, your customer service is really good, your sales team are good, and your delivery's great, marketing will skyrocket that process. It will be a f- fuel under your fire. If you've got any of that wrong and you try and use marketing to fix it, you'll get found out. Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah, I think people have to come to marketing when they're ready, which is tr- hard for us because every, everyone wants the magic pill, right? And and the reality is, well, no, our marketing works best with established businesses who know that there's more potential in their business that, than they've unlocked. Yeah, and that's, and that's why it's important for any business to stay in touch with their leads because the timing just simply might not be right. They might not have enough money, but one day the timing may be right and they might have enough money. So as long as you're still in front of them, you're in with a shout. But if you're not, if you're just in it for the short term, I mean, again, comes back to, well, the previous podcast we recorded about y- you're trying to get all these new people into the top of your funnel when you've got thousands of people already in your funnel, but you're not fucking communicating with yeah. them. Yeah. And, and that kind of, that thinking, and that uh, uh, that's definitely a massive curse of the entrepreneur, is that shiny object syndrome. You're always thinking about the new shiny thing. I must get loads of new leads. And, and again, you're not thinking about the leaks, the holes in your bucket. Um, and shiny object syndrome, it's, it's rife. We've seen people stop doing something that's working for their business simply because they're just a bit bored and something else has caught their eye. Mm. And, it, and it's, it's mad. That's why whenever we have a strategy session, Two of the questions you always ask is, what's worked well for your business and what hasn't worked well for your business? And Sometimes the thing that's worked well, you're like, and what's happened with that now? Oh, well, I sort of stopped doing that a few months ago. Yeah, and I, I think we see that. That's an entrepreneurial <coughs> trait as well, to be fair, that a lot of entrepreneurs chase the rush of doing business. So like the endorphin rush of like getting a massive win in your business, it's obviously epic. Um. But the the kind of there's a that's a high risk strategy to grow in your business to be like, right, I've had a win now I need to get a bigger win. It'd be like being a drug addict. You know, mm, like, yeah. So right, I've I've snorted a line now I need to snort two lines. So I've, it's it's so you kind of like you almost have to get a bit robotic in your attitude towards the highs and the lows in the business and like yeah, fantastic. You've had a record month, but if that doesn't make you feel fulfilled then it's kind of mm. unless you have another record month and another record and, you, and like newsflash you're not going to have record months forever and the same on the other end if you, you're going to have tough months and if that completely wipes you out you just end up in this yo-yo of emotion up and down up and down and you end up chasing the highs not chasing the growth mm-hmm. and the 
and good and I don't necessarily mean financial growth. Growth could be impact, growth could be upskilling the team, growth could be um environmental, like there's so many different measures of success for a business. But if your measure of success is the high of doing business, you're in for a rough time. Mm, those highs and lows. I mean, we've seen, uh, well, a couple of our clients, their their mood, their their feeling of happiness is almost dictated to by, by how their clients are. Clients are happy, oh, they're yeah, happy. Yeah. Clients are sad, they're sad. It's like letting money, I mean, obviously money's important, but certainly letting other people dictate your mood. That's, I mean, that's not just business that's just life in general yeah. whether you're employed or bloody self-employed other people can't be responsible for your happiness and you can't be responsible for other people's happiness either yeah and you know and some people you can you can work with you can help you can coach if they're struggling other people we realize a long time ago just can't be helped you know and i mean i think about some of the people i think you know somebody used to work with us the hours I'd take her aside and, and speak. She was having various challenges and speak to her and try and help her. And uh, and if I'd been in a similar situation, it shared what had worked for me. All a fucking waste of time. Mm. And it just makes me sound like a fucking bad person now I say that out loud. But some people, they just... Sounds they horrible. Just, they, just, they just can't be helped. And again, you, you, you unless you're Matt Therese, you can't and, fix the and, world. And the reality is, not everyone can be helped by you. So, like... There'll be someone out there for them, and that's all right. Mm. Mother Teresa's dead. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm trying to think of someone else. Can help you, that, but yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I mean, like was it Bob Hope? He was a big one, wasn't he? But it's like, yeah, ev- everyone, everyone can be helped. I think optimistically, <laughs> but you can't help everyone, and so you just might not be the right thing for them, and. You gotta know that, haven't you? And taking ownership of that is a really powerful mindset piece to be like, okay, I probably shouldn't have taken this one on. I, I've kind of dug my own grave here. I need to learn, like, what are the positives I can learn from this scenario so I don't do it again, or if I do do it again, it won't turn out like this. So when does that become a rabbit hole? We talk about rabbit holes a lot at the moment. When, you're over when, analyzing when do you decide, right, I, I've got to stop trying to get this person cut, as a I need client, to cut the head off the snake. Or, or just, yeah, you know, like sometimes, like maybe you've got a, a prospect. I think, all oh, right, you know, they, they could become a good client. When do you say, right, actually, right, I fucking jumped through all these hoops. Well, the, the, the irony is, coulda, woulda, shoulda, don't pay the bills. And I struggle with that sometimes, like being entirely honest. But. Until someone is a client, it doesn't really matter. Apart from, you shouldn't get arrogant about that. I'm not. I'm not. Don't be arrogant, dismissive, cold. I'm not saying that at all. But a good thing for a service business, in particular, to have is like a, just a little bit of qualifying criteria, and it could be three or four questions. But you just say to someone that they're, they're like really interested. Oh well, a, a good thing to know if we're like a good fit for each other, or a great thing to know if at some point we're going to do some business together. Can I just ask you a few questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. And as long as they fulfil those four criteria, let them in. But I I know, speaking personally, that if I had that tool in place for clients in the past, there's certain clients that we've worked with that wouldn't have got in. Mm. Yeah. But sometimes you can hear the warning bells, but, you know, that, that thought of, making the till a, a, a new client it's 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 a it's a strong one but you know i think we're old enough and ugly enough to to make a decision maybe sooner rather than well, may, maybe have inter- internal criteria so it's like let's say do i want to take a grand off this client or would i rather work in tesco for a month and if the answer is i'd rather work in tesco for a month don't take the grand but that's, that's a bit of extreme and there's and like i used to work in a supermarket that's actually really fucking hard so respect on that <laughs> but it's the but yeah it's, it's funny I was, um selling my watch on ebay and i'd listed all the criteria and this person asked a question just a message you know about the the battery life or and i said mm. and i screenshotted to show yes it's it's 99 percent um and then she asked another question and you know you just think fucking hell. what do you want what do you want 
And after the third question, I said, are you going to put in a bid in or not? And of course, they didn't put a bid in. And sometimes you think, shit, I should have known. I can almost tell, like, you, you know, was it in this? No, it was in the previous podcast, wasn't it? You were saying you can almost tell by the questions people ask, by how they are in the coffee yeah. queue, how they write on social media, how they write their emails, almost what kind of person they are. And sometimes you've got someone who, there's nothing wrong with asking questions, of course. But when someone's going this and they want that and jump through this hoop, jump through that hoop, it's like, are you going to fucking buy or yeah. not? Yeah, and I, and I, I don't Paul, think... our coach does that really well. Yeah, and are I, you going to buy or not? I don't think it's broad brush judgment. So we're not. I'm not saying they're then therefore a bad person. What I'm saying is they're not compatible with you. Mm-hmm. So it's like you don't like fuss. That, that's I think that's fair to say. You don't like fuss. You don't like fluff. If someone asks you more than three questions about a watch that where all the information is already available, I can imagine they're probably not compatible with you. You, when you say fuss, do you know what I hear? When you say I don't like fuss. What do you hear? I, I look at fuss as time. Yeah. And it, just I'm not saying the older you get, every minute's precious, every minute's always precious. But it's like 15 minutes pissing about on eBay. It's 15 minutes I could have spent with Holly. Mm, which and, is Andy's kid. And well. that's how and that's that's how I look at a lot of stuff now. And like I say, ask a question, of course. If I if I've if I've marketed myself or a client and somehow we've missed the in, some relevant information for people to make a decision to buy or not, okay, we'll answer that. When someone's there, I want to know this, I want to know that, I want to know this, it's like are you gonna become a customer or not? And I think for most entrepreneurs, there is a lot of unnecessary fuss in their lives. By the nature of what you do. So you end up with a lot of spam emails. You end up with a lot of junk mail. You end up with uh, several bank accounts, maybe two phones. You end up with like all these different things Different things going on. You end up with like bloody all the freebies you've collected from all the conferences you've ever been to. A lot of that clutter reduces your ability to make clear decisions. And so... When we say fuss, we don't mean when you go and see your gran and she gives you a cuddle. We mean the the, the unnecessary stuff or the stuff that maybe makes someone not compatible with you as a as a customer supplier relationship. I, I d- and I definitely think I know we've bloody hell, we've been in the game a long time now, but I think where we are in terms of how we write marketing messages for clients now it eliminates that fuss. Sometimes a prospect will have to ask one of our clients a question. Yeah. But generally speaking, the FAQs have been preloaded. We've preempted them and we've got those seeds sown throughout our clients' marketing. Yeah. So yeah. the decision to get in touch or buy is made a lot quicker. And again, that that not forcing someone into a decision, but making a decision easier. You can't underestimate how important that is in marketing. I know this isn't a marketing episode of the podcast, but that that time, that speed, that urgency, there is so much noise uh, in the world. I think that's an important thing for entrepreneurial mindset, though. It's like every time you do something that feels a bit fussy or feels a bit of a drag, what can I do to make this more efficient? Mm, so that, yeah. like, easy one is... Every time you clear your inbox, go into your deleted items and go through and see how many of those you could unsubscribe from. Because the next day you'll get less emails, basically. Um, another easy one. Um, when you move house, don't put a forwarding address on your move because then all the junk mail will come with you. Like Just like little, little easy tips. When you get a new phone, only give the number to people that matter. Like... All these things where I, the cynical side of me would say there are companies out there where it's in their interest to keep you stuck in the fuss because then you'll buy their new widget to get rid of the fuss or um, you know, you'll know you download an app to make your phone black and white and cure all your ills or whatever it might be. When the reality is most of the things to sort that out are directly in front of you. Just do them. Mm. so yeah um, so on that line um, I put my phone away in the evening now mm. 8 o'clock sometimes a bit earlier because I was like oh, I'm just on TikTok 
too much. Now that the algorithm knows what I like, I just get served non-stop like MMA, judo. I'm getting served amazing stuff. stuff on TikTok yeah. at the moment, and and it ain't good. Well, I took so it was stupid. So I took the TikTok app off my phone, and guess what happened? My screen time was the fucking same. So it's not the apps that are the problem; it's the phone. phone. So that's it's designed why I, to make I, you look at yeah, it. So yeah. I put the phone away. So instead of spending time on TikTok, I was just spending more time on other shit. Instagram, yeah, yeah. So just yeah, Instagram. So terrible like, for me. like TikTok for me at the moment serves this thing, and it's like facts you may not know, and it plays this like haunting music, and you can flick through like five historical facts, and it'll be like, on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British forces lost fifty-seven thousand people. And I'm like, fucking hell, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. So then I'll go and read about the Battle of the Somme. Before I know it, an hour's gone. Mm. Um, and my dinner's gone cold, and Hannah's looking at me like, where the fuck have you been for the last hour? And it's like, well, that is not entrepreneurial mindset, is it? So, yeah, my, I'm, I'm in the same boat now. We've, we've got a spare room at home. And come half past seven, my phone goes in the spare room and doesn't get picked up unless it's urgent till the next day. Yeah, I, think, I mean, obviously the phone just an amazing invention but when it comes to thinking clearly and doing the stuff that you need to do and need to focus on to move you forward it can be a massive distraction and for some of our clients you know on the coaching side of things we have to work practically with them on that yeah it's like saying oh yeah sorry i haven't got time to do that i've got time and without getting ruthless about it it's like show me the screen time on your phone mm -hmm. it's like seven hours a day it's hard to say you haven't got time to do something that you know we've agreed is going to move you forward when you're spending seven hours a day fucking on TikTok. Yeah, and like, so, you know, let, I monitor my screen time. My screen time is high because a lot of the work I do is on my phone. But that's also an excuse I tell myself to allow me to have high screen time. So it's, you know, I, I, let's face it, like my, my wife works outdoors. My screen time should be higher than mm. hers. Yeah. I don't think my screen time should be eight hours a day, which I think it was last week, but that's because I took a week off. <laughs> I was hell. bored out of my mind. <laughs> so do, do you think, I mean, I mean, to go back to s like dealing with the public and, and wanting to keep everyone happy, there still is that pressure to play it too safe when it comes to, to someone's growth mindset? Pushing <laughs> themselves. I don't want to piss anyone off. I don't want anyone to think I'm a twat. I don't want anyone to think who does he, he or she think yeah. they are. Yeah, and there is a misconception that your mindset is all about being resilient, and it's not. It's partly about being resilient. But if you try and be like a bull in a china shop and, um, well, I don't care if people think I'm a twat. It's going to mm. come across. Mm. People are just going to think you're a wanker. So it, it is more subtle than that. It's it's more about having having the ability to shift your focus. So it's like someone emails you saying, oh, I think you're a twat. <laughs> being able to not have that consume your entire day, being able to still enjoy time with your kids or still mm -hmm. um, taste your food properly at lunchtime, be present, mm -hmm. enjoy a cup of tea, like really little things. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the the difference. I think a lot of people don't quite grasp that they're in control of their thoughts. And so being obliterated by a shitty email from a client or a parking fine or whatever it might be um, is they're not they're doing themselves a disservice now I'm not saying they're wrong because it's bloody awful when you're that wound up by things it's not a nice feeling and it's horrible to see people go through it but there are options there are things you can do Go for a walk, get some fresh air, go to the gym. That's why I think, you know, you talk about purpose and vision a lot. I think when when you're really dialed in to what you're here to do, what you want to do, lots of stuff that would have bothered you before becomes less significant. Mm. So we know we used to be the people who someone would send a shitty email on a Friday night and it would fucking our, ruin our weekend. Now, we probably won't be checking our email on a Friday night, but if we were... We could compartmentalise that because I know that that's someone who is not going to make a difference to my life, my wife's life or my children's life. And I'm going to focus on my purpose and vision, which is to do X, Y, Z and off I crack. Yeah. I, I know from a position of vulnerability that when I lose sight of my purpose, 
things start to go to shit. Shad fishing, have you heard of that? Oh God, is that like when people play violin music and well, stuff? Well, yeah, no, I hadn't heard about it. Just that conference I went to, they were talking about vulnerability. And obviously I know you've got to be in your bonnet about the massive difference between vulnerability and using it to help someone. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they were talking about, well, the same thing, but they called it sad fishing when you're basically wanting the violins to play and people to say, are you okay, hon? You okay? And I just hadn't heard that term before. It's and good, I thought, good phrase. Yeah, cool, that, yeah I'd not heard uh, that. Yeah, to nick that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about sad fishing. I'm talking about... If you're every once in a while as an entrepreneur, you're gonna feel a slump, you're gonna have maybe someone hasn't paid, maybe you've got problems at home, whatever it might be, and you'll lose sight of your purpose and vision, what you're trying to do. And that's when you need to lean on all the other structures you've got. That might be, you know, journaling, mm -hmm. exercise, mm -hmm. walking the dog, reading, doing your job whatever it might be. Um, and, I, and I do think that having that sense of purpose, now I'm not saying we all need to think we're Jesus. That's not, that's not. It's just like having a bit of clarity about like, what's my why? Why? Like, and it might be something as simple as um, I want my wife or my, my significant other to have, to have a lovely life. That, that's a good, that's a solid purpose. It might be, I want to change the world. Neither, neither of those are right. Neither of those are wrong. But, I think when you haven't got a reason, life is just that little bit tougher. And so the the trick as an entrepreneur is sometimes you get you get to your reason a bit quicker than you think you're going to, and you need to find a new one. Yeah. And then and then it's about working with people who can help you unlock that. Do you think every mindset podcast we do just comes back to Simon Sinek every time? It's like start He's with solid, why. isn't he? It He's is, solid. Yeah. Him and Robin Sharma have yeah. got it pretty dialed in. Yeah. Every time I watch one of his videos, I'm like, fucking hell, that's pretty simple, but that is so good. He did one about Navy SEALs and about um, like trust and performance. Just a simple diagram on a flip chart. I was like, shit, that's powerful. But yeah, start with why. When you know why you're doing what you're doing and, and who for, you summed up, to have a purpose that involves other people, your, your partner, your children, whatever someone sending a shitty email becomes just like insignificant yeah, yeah. And, and i think over time as well university you know, breeds character all that kind of stuff when when you are out of your comfort zone now and then when you've had to deal with shit just over time you just become a bit more bulletproof to it it's when you try and stick your head in the sand and avoid those situations that's when i think problems can occur yeah yeah I've, yeah you've as an entrepreneur you've You've got to be willing to put your head above the parapet and ultimately you've got to have the techniques in place to deflect sometimes move your focus away from the shit that's being thrown at you yeah nice one powerful stuff what do people need to do if they want to talk about that a bit more andy apply for a free discovery call at codebreak.co.uk